Hello and welcome to Trigonometry. I'm Francis Foster. I'm Constantine Kisson. And this is a show for you if you're sick of people arguing on the internet over subjects they know nothing about. At Trigonometry, we don't pretend to be the experts, we ask the experts. Our fantastic expert guest this week is a psychologist and author, Dr. Linda Papadopoulos. Welcome to Trigonometry. Thank you for having me. Well, it's great to have you here. And before we get started, what we always like to do is ask the, the guests to tell the viewers a little bit about how they are, where they are, who they are, just a little bit of background to, to, to get them to know you. Sure. Well, I'm a psychologist. Um, I've, um, I, I guess I've been really lucky in that I, I got into psychology um, at a very young age and I've been able to kind of follow sort of several passions around my interests. Um, range from uh, the mind-body connection, so I did a lot of work on kind of psychoneuroimmunology and skin in, in the early days, and I went off and I did a lot of work um, kind of Jason's out on body image, the way that we look, how it affects how we feel. Uh, that then led me into things like objectification, sexualization, so I did a lot of um, work and policy work as well, kind of advising how the way that we um, portray each other and understand those portrayals affects um, our, our judgments, the way that we behave. Um, and then um, I've also gotten to do, I guess, um, some some really kind of perhaps less highbrow but really interesting stuff. So I've done a lot of media work where I think um, it's been really lovely being able to kind of take these concepts that you normally write about in, in academic journals to the to the public. So I've had, you know, several TV shows. I've written for popular magazines um, and as well as my academic books. I've written lots of uh, self-help books as well. And you have your own podcast as well, as well, which we'll talk about. Uh, well, actually, before we started the interview, we sat down. We hadn't met before. We started chatting and it very quickly became apparent that we are quite aligned in terms of what we often talk about um, with, with you and so let, let's just get straight into it first of all one of the things you know this is called trigonometry and we briefly mentioned that uh, I was telling you the study that I saw that telling giving people trigger warnings actually primes them to be to have a negative experience of whatever it is and you were like yeah please please ask me about that on, on the show so what, what do you want to say to us as a psychologist about that if you think of um, one of the things that we do in cognitive therapy, right, when someone comes in and says, look, this is happening to me and it's really bothering me, one of the things that we do is we look at erroneous thinking. So if I've come in and I've said, you know, oh, you know, I, I don't like stripes, it may be that you hear, well, Linda doesn't like me. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it later. We'll have it. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, or she's being offensive and she's being directly offensive. Now, if you were having therapy, they'd be like, well, maybe it's just that Linda had a bad experience with stripes. Maybe it's nothing personal. Maybe Maybe before you kind of personalize this and become triggered by it, maybe you need to check out with Linda why she said that. So in a lot of ways, these, these trigger warnings, in a lot of ways kind of priming people to be offended is the exact opposite of what we do in CBT, which is take a step back and reevaluate that thought, right? If I'm going out of my way to find something to be offended about, then I will be. And there's a value in being offended because if I'm offended, I can put myself in the role of someone who's a victim, then they need to take care of me. I can get sort of some sort of, I can get social points because I've called you out for being whatever, being unthoughtful, uncaring. Um, so th there's a reason why this happens. And I think one of the things that that I think we see a lot of these days with regards to, to people feeling that vulnerability is precisely because I think a lot of young people grew up in a culture where their parents got rid of obstacles. They were like snowplows. So they had a problem with the teacher, they went and they spoke to the teacher on their behalf. They, you know, they didn't like not being invited to a kid's party. They'd complain and they'd speak to the mother and they'd be invited to the party. A big part of dealing with life is having the resilience to come back and realize that sometimes shit happens not because someone's out to get me, but because things happen and I have to find the strength to overcome these things. So I just kind of feel that a lot of the way that we're talking about trigger warnings and language being dangerous basically de-skills people from being able to cope with these things. And, and I certainly wouldn't want that, you know, for, for, for my child or any of the young people that I work with. Mm. And do you think this behavior is addictive, that once you start and you cast yourself in the role of victim, you get this attention, you think to yourself, hang on, I quite enjoy this, whether consciously or sub subconsciously. Well, th there's, I think there's a power in, um, in being 
and being seen and being heard. And look, I think there are some genuine people that are victimized out there, and I think it's important that we say that, and I think they should be able to speak up and talk about it. But I think intent's important, right? If I bump into you, and I didn't mean to bump into you, then surely that matters, yeah. right? Yeah. Now, the amount you hurt, you know, if you're really hurt, that, that, yeah, that matters too, but the intent has to come into it. And I kind of fear that it's very rarely about intent. It's very rarely that I didn't notice you had the striped shirt on before I said, I don't like striped shirt. I keep going on with the shirt. I'm sorry. With the shirt. <laughs> I, I always enjoy when your fashion sense gets destroyed. destroyed yeah, yeah, yeah. That's always the best. I, I did show this to my girlfriend <laughs> yesterday, and she just looked at it and then walked out the room. <laughs> you know when you're trying to pet a cat, and it's like, no, I'm out. <laughs> so there we go. The moral of the story is listen to your girlfriend. <laughs> yeah, 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 and listen to her disapproval. Mm. Right, um, do you think social media has made this worse? The fact that, you know, we're all constantly logged in, we're all looking for approval, we're all looking for likes, etc., etc., etc. I, I think it's um, it's a huge part of it. I think, yes, the looking for approval and likes, but I think also kind of the distillation of one's ideology down to their, you know, most thoughtless tweet, right? Mm -hmm. So, if, if you know, surely we're an amalgam of, of all of, you know, the, the ways that we interact, our interactions, our opinions, everything else, but because I can look into your background and come up with the one time that you used, a, you know, whatever, a, you know, a word in the wrong way, or you re-liked something you didn't think about and you retweeted it, I think these things mean that um, we are walking on eggshells. We're constantly so anxious of being misunderstood um, because there, like we said earlier, there's there's something um, in calling out people for being wrong. So we've got this very weird situation where we want to be seen. So we're constantly kind of saying, this is what I feel about this and I have an opinion about that. But at the same time, the rest of us are kind of looking to call each other out because there's a value in that as well. So like the kind of the discourse isn't the healthiest. We're not kind of talking to get to a better place of understanding. We're talking to kind of call each other out and see, well, hold on, maybe you didn't see that in the right way. And then that, you know, then those kind of Twitter wars start. And, yeah. And do you think it's sort of, uh, it increases people's narcissism using the social media? Well, yeah, I think it's inevitable that something that, um, that, that, that makes you think about how you're seen in such a nuanced way increases narcissism. And, 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 and I don't mean that, I mean, it's actually really kind of heartbreaking. So I've been a psychologist for, for many, many years, and sort of even things that I see a lot of, the way that they're depicted to me have changed. I do a lot with eating disorders. And, um, you know, for, for many years, the, the big thing was a number, right? So I want to be this weight, I want to be this size. And then more recently, people are bringing in sort of pictures from Instagram with sort of hashtags like bikini bridge or thigh gap or box gap, which means we're kind of standing outside ourselves and looking in. We're kind of, you know, self-objectifying. Now, this self-objectification, while there's a narcissistic element, there's also an element that kind of belies incredibly dangerous um, low self-esteem because, you know, not only am I looking at myself through my eyes but through the eyes of you know everyone else that I feel is looking at me and through their values and through the way that they're gonna assess me um, so yeah I, I always say if I was gonna create a an exercise for poor self-esteem I'd, I'd tell people to take a bunch of pictures of themselves look through the ones that are like the least awful then find that one and then spend you know 20 minutes filtering it thinking of a great hashtag then put it up on social media then sit back and wait for the likes and if 50 don't come in the first 20 minutes take it down and start over again that is literally Surely an exercise in you know in poor self-esteem yet you know so many people do it day in day out and and this idea of not being able to live up to your selfie you know this discrepancy between who I am and who I'm projecting I think is having a significant effect on mental health because there's there's no ability to rest from from what does everybody else think about me that's constantly there there's no ability to just say well, this is who I am and maybe this can be okay and I've always thought as well that the kind of part of your job as a human being as you mature is to start to get to a point where your self-esteem is driven by what you think about yourself, like a kind of sense of who you are. And it seems like social media is taking that away from us and kind of almost exploring our vulnerabilities as human beings. Would you say that we're particularly vulnerable to social media as humans? Well, this is such an interesting point. So again, if you look at um, 
sort of human evolution, we've not evolved to kind of absorb the opinions of thousands and thousands of people on ourselves, right? We tend to live in sort of in groups, and, and there's some research that attests the fact that even the amount of friends that we have should be no more than about 100. We, we just can't handle anymore. That's how we've evolved. It works well. So social media is all about the numbers, like you say. And so, you know, being able to assimilate this kind of, I, I mean, there's like bathroom doors. Anyone can write whatever it is on the back, but because they're not in a little cubicle with a smelly toilet, they're there for everyone to see, it matters. Whatever's written matters. And if thousands and thousands of people's opinions uh, and the diversity of them matter, again, that, that's a recipe for disaster because not only do you, do you not rest from it, but you're never, like you say, able to say, do you know what? This is who I am. This is the imperfect version of who I am. And while I think we all want to, you know, self-actualize and reach our potential, you know, part of that is saying, I'll never play in the MBA if I'm a certain height, or I'll never have a singing career if I can't, and I, or whatever it is, mm-hmm. and, and being okay with that. And I think that's that's harder when, you know, those goalposts are always, you know, sort of changing about who you ought to be, and everyone's telling you, well, you're not there yet. What, what do you think about, what do you think makes social media so addictive? What, do, is it specifically, has they designed it that way? Why do we buy into it so much? Like even I do it. Even I do it. The first thing I do when I wake up in the morning is check Instagram. Yeah. Uh, because okay, this is very interesting. Again, so up until relatively recently, psychology has been used to help people, right? So you have a problem, you go to a psychologist, you help them. Um, in the last sort of. 20, 30 years, psychology is slowly b- being used to, to persuade people. There's, there's places called sort of persuasive technology labs, usually where, you know, uh, places where tech exists, right? So like Silicon Valley, where our psychology is being used against us. So for example, I don't know, um, you guys obviously, Netflix, right? I love Netflix. I can't watch one show anymore. I rarely, if I'm watching a series, I can rarely turn off and watch. Now the reason for that is they know that if they start the next one right away, like they do, I'm more likely to stay. They take away a barrier. If I can skip the intro, I'm more likely to stay. They take away another barrier. Because the metric for the success of social media sites is time spent online. So they ensure, and not because they're evil, I don't think anyone with these social media companies is bad or evil, they're just trying to to maximize their profit, maximize how successful they are. So if time spent online is what they want, when I'm devising whatever, Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, I'm going to ensure, well, what will make you more likely to say? Well, I know that notifications will. Why? Do you know um, there's something called variable reward system, you know, like uh, slot machines? Yeah. You know why they're addictive? If every time you pulled it, you know, something would come out, there'd be not much to it. You'd get it when you wanted it. But the fact that sometimes it comes out every three times you pull it, sometimes it comes out every five times, means you're much more likely to go back. We know that. That's very basic human behavior. Now, that variable reward system exists on all social media sites. It exists in when you see that little uh, notification at the bottom. It exists when you're going to get some sort of validation, when you get the, you know, the retweet. It exists when someone likes something. We know that. Now, also, there's gender differences here, right? So. Um, If we look at the way that boys um, and girls react differently, we know that boys tend to be much more apt to gaming addiction. Why is that? Because from an evolutionary perspective, men have evolved to seek out competency, especially during those teen years, young boys. Now, what does that mean? That means I want to feel like I'm getting good at something. Now, what better thing than if I give you a game that I kind of ding, 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 give you a reward every little while, every little increment, so I feel better, and I get that dopamine rush, and I play more, so I get more of a dopamine rush. So that becomes quite addictive. For girls, we're taught to seek out kind of that social equity, right? Do do you like me? Am I, you know, do I have that equity? Do Do you enjoy, you know, being with me? And as a consequence, again, those hearts, those likes are going to be very validating and rewarding. So, you know, behind your phone, this is not just a platform. There's, you know, there's dozens of people with PhDs in psychology, you know, way smarter than, you know, than the average person in terms of how they understand human beings behavior, how they understand themselves, all, you know, ensuring that you spend as much time as possible on these platforms. And do you think that there's anything that can be done or what, 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 what's going to be the impact, first of all, of this if you project it into the future? And is there anything we can do as a society, maybe legislatively, to, to start to curb some of these things? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think it will. I think we're already beginning to see so um, sort of gaming addictions already accepted in places like Japan. Um, not not yet um, in the in the states, but I think it, it's happening. We know that. Um, we know that. Um, again, even from a, a psychological point of view, um, you know, self harm, um, which we we tend to see quite a lot of it, especially with sort of adolescents, young adults, we're beginning to see that in the digital form. So digital self-harm, where young people are bullying themselves online anonymously. Now, this is a new thing. And what? We, yeah. <laughs> You've got to tell us more about it. I've never heard of this. So um, there's been cases where um, young people have been horrifically bullied online. And as we know, there's been you know, horrific cases where they've taken their own lives or attempted to. And what we find now is in some cases, certainly, certainly not all, but in some cases, uh, these young people will actually be in such a low place that they create another profile and they bully themselves. They call themselves stupid or ugly or horrible. And the premise, we believe, because this is very new, this is not something we know, uh, you know, we don't have much data on, but we believe it's the same thing. It's about, um, it's about showing the pain, showing the, the pain I feel inside and, and externalizing it and being able to deal with it. So, um, you know, all of these things are, are affecting us. And this is just mental health. Cognitive health is being affected as well. We know that millennials now, there's some studies to attest to the fact that millennials have worse memories than seniors. And we know... <laughs> We know that because when you consolidate a memory, if you keep being interrupted, you're never going to consolidate that mm -hmm. memory. So try and remember something when I keep, you know, you keep hearing buzzing or pinging or you're having to re-answer that email. There's a reason for this. Sleep disorders, huge problem. They're on the rise. Why? Because this blue light that we're constantly on affects us. Sleep's really important. We believe that sleep is one of the factors that is implicated in depression. So there's so much going on. And, and I think kind of our tech has outpaced our social evolution, our physiological evolution, and we're, we're trying to play catch up. And what responsibility do the social media companies have for our mental health? Do, I mean, is it simply the fact that, you know, we're all individuals and, you know, we need to be responsible for ourselves? Or do they need to take some responsibility for essentially manipulating us and in getting us to engage in this addictive behaviour? I think I think you know they they do need to take some responsibility. Um, you know, it, it can't be that everywhere else we have regulation, like the ads that kids see. You know, the watershed. Do you remember the watershed? That was a thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You I know? remember that. Yeah. Completely irrelevant now, but yeah. there was a reason we had the watershed, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, some responsibility needs to be taken. I think the problem is is that. Um, the way that our, our governments are set up to, to kind of regulate these things often doesn't apply when you don't understand, because of the way that these companies are set up, you know, where, not just where they're domiciled, but what they actually do. Well, I'm a publishing company. I just let people put videos on my site. You know, so it's all this kind of, well, what do you actually do, though? If you're, if you're not taking, you know, if these videos are dangerous, whose responsibility is it? Is it you for providing the platform? Or is it the person putting up? So we need to have some serious conversations about this. I think government needs to come in with some sort of better guidelines about usage for young people, especially for kids. And we are slowly getting more information. But again, you guys need to remember, it's sort of, you know, what, Facebook's a teenager, you know? Snapchat's, what, seven, eight years old? Instagram, nine, ten. The, you know, these are all new, so we're kind of trying to figure it out but I don't think it's good enough saying you know well you know the internet's the one place where you're allowed to have no legislation or no, or no restrictions you know it, it, it's, it seems ridiculous to me that in every other area of our lives we have at least some semblance of guide, guidance. And the one thing that I notice with social media is from my days as a teacher is year on year seeing children being less adept at social interaction and obviously I've never done a study on it but I just always thought, and then you saw them, the moment you gave their phones back at the end of the day, because we took the phones off them at the start, they were 10, 11, the moment they, first thing they do, switch on, go on, whatever it is. And, but you saw a lot of the time that arguments would happen in a playground, not because there was antagonism, not because um, they, you know, they, they, there, was, there was a bullying issue at, at times, it was simply because they didn't know how to articulate their thoughts and listen to one another. And I found that terrifying. Yeah, yeah. Because it's practice, right? You know, that's that's mm. how we learn, you know, and we learn to read each other and, and speak and we you know, the nuances of voice inflection, everything. It's practice. When you don't have that, you know, of course it's going to be anxiety provoking. And we know that, you know, with any 
anything in life, the more you avoid, the bigger the problem becomes. If, if I'm afraid of, of social gatherings and I stop going to them, eventually, you know, it's hard to get out of my front door at some point because I've avoided, avoided. And likewise with communication. So I think we definitely need to foster that, you know. And I, and I think the other thing that you speak about young people, I have such an issue with kind of the, the age segregation that happens, right? So that, you know, the 14-year-olds just speak with other 14-year-olds, <laughs> the millennials just with the millennials. There's something important with, you know, the quirky aunt or the, the funny grandma that you hung out with, you know, where we had that. And I think now, again, because of these connections, which are wonderful in a lot of ways that we can have friends around the world, but I can literally, you know, be so isolated and, and have these quote unquote echo chambers, not just in terms of political views, but also in terms of the uniformity of the people I choose to speak with. And that in and of itself is dangerous because the young people you're worried about are speaking about other, with other young people who are absolutely fine talking like that. So you're the one that's kind of a bit odd. What are you worried about? You know, everyone <laughs> else suddenly, I speak to is fine, right? So. This suddenly reminds me of my own school days. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
to sort of look at the good science that, that's out there um, and not fall prey. And, and again, look, I know it comes from a good place and, uh, you know, people, you know, absolutely who have been oppressed, whatever group sort of, you know, should absolutely be able to fight for their rights and, and uh, you know, and we should all support them. But I think that can't happen to the detriment of what we know for sure. So pretending that, you know, biology doesn't matter is, is I think, it's, it's, it's not a fair or accurate statement. Do you think there's, in intellectual circles, there's a lot, there's this dishonesty happening where people feel that they have to parrot a certain viewpoint because if they don't, they, you know, they could be seen to be, in inverted commas, you know, uh, a bigot or whatever else. Or do, have you ever felt that pressure or in your career? Look, I, I try, I... I try and be honest with what I believe. I, I do. I try and substantiate what I say. I think that's very important right. because I think when you have science behind you and you say what you say, then it's it's easier. Having said that, I think people will often hear what they want to hear. Um, you know, and and you know, one worries if. Yeah, I think again because of social media, because of you know this you know this kind of caricaturization of each other when we don't believe in each other, right? So I take this one thing you've said and I've turned you into this caricature of the one thing, it doesn't help. And I think people become afraid because unless you have a forum where you can sit down and discuss in sort of long form what you mean, then it becomes dangerous. And I think preci that's precisely why podcasts like this do quite well, <laughs> because I think you have enough time to have a proper detailed discussion about what you mean. Um, whereas I think the rest of the time, we're trying to do this in 160 characters or less, and you simply can't. You, know, you can't get to the essence um, and the nuance and the difficulties with these discussions in forums like that. And even something like this, actually, I mean, YouTube, if you go on, YouTube, on the YouTube after when we put this episode out, you will see that there are some people who absolutely go for it in that way. They will listen to the hour. They will go, well, 40 minutes was really interesting, but this thing I really didn't agree mm -hmm. with or whatever, which is great, mm -hmm. right? But there will also be people now, I think, who are so trained in that kind of Twitter mentality that they will go, they will listen to one minute mm -hmm. and then they will pick something they don't like and then comment about that and not watch the rest of the conversation. I think that's scary. It's well, it's it's not only scary. It's it's again, it's intellectually dishonest. It's bad science. Mm. <laughs> you know, uh, you can't take you know something out of context. You know, and again, I kind of go back sort of the way that you see people clinically. You know, one of the things when you know when I work with someone that's depressed, I say one of the things that a depressive mind does is it looks for things to be sad about. So you're going to look at news stories that are sad. You're going to look at something that's going on in the street that makes you sad. You selectively find it. If you're looking for something to be offended by, if you're looking, that's again, that's that's uh, that's not the healthiest way to to relate to the world around you. You know, you need to look at things in you know in the wider context, look at what was being discussed, and then make you know make that assumption. And where do you think this comes from? Sorry, Francis. Where do you think this uh, increased vulnerability, increased kind of pursuit of victimhood, almost? Where do you think w that comes from? Um, I think. I think partly um, because so many obstacles, I think, were kind of taken away from young people, I think there is this fear. I think there's a genuine fear that I won't be able to cope. If you say something I don't like, I won't be able to cope because I've not had to before. So I think people aren't used to it. I think also that there's um, there's value in it, that they get something. So, you you know, being being in the sick role, whatever that means, means that, you know, you're going to be taken care of. There's going to be special things put around you. I also think that, again, if we look at the research on this. So there's all this research that this is increasing in university campuses. Actually, it's not so much, it hasn't really increased. What's happened is that people are pandering to the minority more. That's what's happened. Mm -hmm. So on university campuses where we see, since I think about 2013, we've been seeing this whole kind of trigger warning, I know we can't have free speech. I think what's happened is it's you've seen sort of university administrators kind of take over and pander to the loudest, most offended voice. So, you know, I, I think sometimes we're misrepresenting sort of younger people and millennials you know, as being this kind of, oh, they're these terrible snowflakes. I just think what's, you know, what's happening is that the minorities uh, 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 that, that get offended extremely easily and want to shut down conversation, have that, have been given, you know, uh, much bigger forms to be able to do this. And there's, there's some literature to attest to that. But there is actually a reason for that, which is that the faculty has become far more culturally left-leaning over mm. the years. So the ratio used to be in the 60s, it would be like one uh, conservative for like 10 liberals yeah. and now it's like one for 300 
Yeah, uh, we, we have a, a guy called coming in to speak to us called Eric uh, Kaufman, who's a professor of politics later, uh, and he there's something he talks about in his book that just how that has changed over time. Um, and also universities, they're self-selective as well, is something that people, Jonathan Hyde talks about. Yeah. This is, people who go to university are liberal yeah. anyway. Yeah. And then if you've got basically all very liberal professors, that will happen yeah. and that minority is yeah. being pandered to. And I think one of the things that Jonathan Haidt speaks about a lot as well is this idea that we need some diversity of thought, you mm. know, this, this heterogeneity, because, we, we, you know, we, if we're just bouncing off and saying the same things over and over again, it, you know, obviously it's going to amplify that one, you know, one idea or one notion. We all seem to want diversity in, in more and more, in, from what I can see. It was just we're talking about diversity, but we don't seem to want diversity of thought, especially diversity that challenges our own opinions. Because what seems to happen at this point is shutting down, no, you're wrong, let's smear you as whatever X, Y, and Z. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and it's something to be really and rightfully afraid of. You know, I think a lot of people fear that because... Um, it's just easier to not do your homework and assume that that person said that thing. And because these ideas spread so quickly, um, people are much more likely, as you said earlier, to kind of think, well, do you know what? Maybe it's better if we don't. But then you have to ask your, yourself the question, well, what happens if we continue not to? You know, yeah. Isn't it precisely the thing that we fear the most? This idea of, you know, a big brother of someone watching you you know, we're watching each other now. This is like, you know, and, and that's kind of the really worrying thing, that we're watching each other to catch each other out, to tell on each other. That doesn't make for, like, a happy society, right? And it's fine if you're, you know, if we if we disagree, if you're like, well, you know, you got this wrong, do you know about this? But it needs, you know, to enter into it with the idea that we're, we're not all coming from a place of being bad people. You know, we're all trying to trying to get to a better place of understanding. And when I, you know, when I work with couples, I always say, look, if you have an argument, you know, move it from between you and put it in front of you and sit down and try and figure it out together. It's one of the best techniques, you know, to do that. And the whole point of an argument is not to win it, it's to get to a better place of understanding. If we approach these political arguments like that, that I'm not trying to, you know, turning it into left and right and, you know, Democrat and Republican, uh, yeah. Remember? yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure, a bit of orange face popped into my head there and I got all confused. Yeah. Um, you know, instead of we were trying to have, you know, proper discussions about understanding each other better without calling each other names and vilifying each other, then maybe we'd get somewhere. But, you, you know, it, very sadly, I think, you know, you see too many times it turns into this name calling and, and that just that doesn't help at all. And I think that's where the social media comes into because so many times I can... I, I used to have arguments with people on Facebook all the time about politics and all this kind of thing, and I've really stopped. But in, when I used to, I'd, I'd talk to that person online and we'd have a disagreement and they wouldn't go anywhere. And the next time I saw that person in person, we could have a conversation. And to, sometimes you find out you don't even have a disagreement. Uh, and that, to me, is, is a big indicator. But, ha I mean, we, we're increasingly, that's how we communicate. But what Constantine is trying to say with that is that he's a massive troll, Linda. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, oh, definitely, <laughs> definitely. But, but that face-to-face communication, what is it about face-to-face -face communication that makes us more able to have the conversation? Because face-to-face -face is not, you know, people think that verbal communication is about what's being said. That's a small proportion mm -hmm. of it. It's about body language. It's about inflection of voice. It's about, you know, I know when you're ready to speak. It's, you know, think about when we're speaking, right? You know when I'm about to finish and you know when to come in. We don't say it to each other, but we just, it's that, that rhythm. Now, all of this together, right, the context, the body language, the inflection, all these nuances means that you get a lot more. So if, I'm, if you were to say to me, don't be ridiculous, Linda, looking at me and speaking, I could get take it as a joke if you tweet me you're being ridiculous or don't be ridiculous I don't see you kind of smiling I don't see that in the you know in the backdrop of we've had this great conversation so it automatically we you know without all that context I can take it differently and again we've had you know I have this great slide that I show this talk that I do there's about kind of there's something called um, ultimate, I think, is it ultimate social penetration? Something like that. So it's about 50 million users, right? When something reaches 50 million users. I think the radio took something like 38 years, and I think the TV took 20 years. And I think, you know, you go lower and lower. So the, you know, the, the internet took, you know, five years, and mobile phones took three years, and Angry Birds took 35 days. Mm. <laughs> now, <laughs> you got to remember that, you know, 
these are all different ways of communicating. So through the radio, we had this great big span of time, the TV, phones, you know, you know, all of a sudden, not only am I not seeing you, I'm trying to figure out, you know, what, what these emojis mean. You know, you're sending me various, you know, faces and, and I'm trying to figure those out. It's, it's not something that happens, you know, overnight and yet it feels like it, it has and I think we're still playing catch up. And so that's why communication is so much harder in some ways. I also think it's about threat of force. If you're talking to someone face to face, some of the stuff that people will say to us online, they would never say that to your face because they'd probably get punched yeah. in the face. Well, it's like being inside a car. You, know, you scream mm -hmm. at people all the time when you're inside your car. Ah, you would never, if someone like bumped into you on the road, you wouldn't be like, what the hell are you doing? You'd be like, oh, sorry, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. By all means, why do we do it? It's the same thing. We feel protected. We feel so, yeah. But isn't it also as well that we carry around this latent anger with us about Speak our for day. yourself, mate. Just, well, you, you two can have a, a, a session of psychotherapy just yeah. right now. I'll just sit and watch. But, you Late know, and anger, go Yeah, on. but, yeah. you know, we, we get frustrated at things that happen to us in our lives. We get resentments. We get... And all of a sudden, somebody says something online. You're like, nah, or in your car. Yeah. And it's just a way of venting, of projecting. Of a, it's a release valve, isn't it, really? Yeah, yeah, it's a release valve. I don't have to see how much I've upset you. I can then turn it off and go make a cup of tea and forget about it, you know, and it becomes, you know, a way of lashing out with no consequence or potentially mm. no consequence. So yeah, I think it is. I think it's a really ineffective one. Um, I don't think, you know, people should construe that as an effective way because, you know, these things, you know, thoughts aren't intangible things. You know, you think enough negative stuff, it, of course it affects you. We know now psychophysiologically it affects you. So I think, you know, people that, that carry around that much anger and, and hurt and stuff, you know, uh, kind of venting it and putting it out there is, is not a way of properly dealing with it. While it might in the short term feel like uh, a vent, you know, it's it, the stuff's still there. So on a serious note, you know, if people, you know, people really need to look at themselves if they're doing that. All right, well, let's wrap up the social media section with a positive message. So if you were to give some advice to people who feel like maybe social media usage is starting to become a problem for them, uh, what what can people do to kind of wean themselves off that? Um, you know, I, I think I think you need to understand social media is a press release, right? It's, it's sort of the press release is about our lives, and we all do it. So um, there's all this really interesting research that we post when we're on a high and we surf when we're on a low, right? Mm -hmm. So we post when we're out in Michelin star restaurant, and we surf when we're eating leftovers. So remember that. So you know, read it as a press release. These are the superlatives of each other's lives. Try and use it to connect, but also remember that the proper connections that, that you make actually, you know, they don't care, you know, about what you're reading, what you're wearing, what's going on. So I've kind of this, you know, the, these proper, the things that nourish us, nourish us the most, you know, in terms of humor interactions, don't have to do with people liking us if. They have to do with people liking us because, just because, right? So foster those relationships, use it, you know, uh, you know, for fun, but I certainly wouldn't say don't base your self-esteem on it and certainly don't base, you know, this sense of self-worth on it either. You've done a lot of work, Linda, moving on, um, with the, uh, how our mental health is reflected in our skin and the way we are. Would you be able to expand on that a little bit? Sure. So, um, uh, um, so the skin and the central nervous system are actually really closely related. They develop out of the same stuff, embryologically, the ectoderm, which means that many times um, we see that our stress levels, the way that we feel, kind of manifest in skin conditions if we have a predisposition to them. And this is something that I studied um, uh, for quite a while, and, and I looked at um, the extent to which our emotions affect the onset and progression of different conditions. And we found that they very much do. I kind of think that, um, you know, again, going back, you know, our thoughts aren't intangible things. If I sit around feeling very stressed and very anxious, a lot of things are going to happen in my body physiologically. So, I don't know, let's give the example of a pimple, right? You get a pimple right before the big day that you're waiting for, right before the date or right before the, you know, the, the big interview. What happens? We know that when you get stressed, your cortisol rises. We also know 
that testosterone is likely to rise when you get stressed. When testosterone rises, we know that sebum production rises. We know when sebum production rises, you're much more likely to get a clogged pore and boom, you get a pimple on the big day. So there's a way of understanding how your skin reacts to stress. And if you can clock it, if you can clock how your stress affects the way that your skin develops and, and, and the health of your skin, then you can work towards making it better. So we did a study years ago, my I actually got into this because my cousin had vitiligo and um, she struggled with it for, for years. And we looked at vitiligo and, and we were able to, to have significant um, reduction through talking therapies, right? So either this, it would cease or there would be a reduction. And in these talking therapies, it was CBT, it was a CBT protocol that basically looked at how to deal with stressful life situations. And since then, um, some of my amazing doctoral students um, who now have positions in dermatology units um, have, are doing brilliantly waiting times or dermatology units are falling because so much of the way that our skin the way that it functions has to do with what's going on in our minds but also what goes on in our minds has to do with how our skin looks remember if you have a skin disease people feel that they're able to ask right? if you're walking around with an ulcer no one can see it if you're walking around with some eczema people will ask you what's that or they'll look at it or they'll be kind of anxious to take something from your hand that has an effect on you. So being able to mitigate those effects by using good you know, uh, techniques, psychological techniques, really helps, we've found. Why, do, why, do, why is it that whenever I get stressed, I get eczema? Immediately, that's the first thing, and it's always the same place. Yeah. It's always the back of the legs, yeah. and it's just a disc, and I can feel it. The moment I get anxious, it starts with the itching, and then before I know it, there's a flare-up. Yeah. And again, so you have you were born with a predisposition to, to eczema, and the stress ensures that the the kind of the, the mechanisms through which that eczema comes about are triggered, right? So what would be really useful for you is if you know that something is coming on. So you know if you if you can understand why that stress is coming on, is it work? Is it you know too much on your plate? Constantin. <laughs> <laughs> is it constantin? Oh, you... I know when I'm succeeding. <laughs> when he's got eczema. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. We have to Hoover after yeah. the interview. <laughs> But you know what would be really great, rather than waiting till it gets there, on a serious note, is to kind of say, okay, I know these next three weeks are going to be really tough, right? So yeah. what am I going to do? What are the things that allow me to feel better? And for you know, it's different things for different people. Some people meditate, some people exercise, some people just speak to friends, you know. To, mm. But do it. It's you know, I always say to my patients, it's amazing how much time, you know, we we make in our diaries for work, but we very rarely put in time for for our physical health. And you need to take it as seriously as that. I know this is a crazy next three weeks. I'm this is what's going to happen. I'm going to take some time out to ensure that I'm okay. And hopefully you'll find that kind of helps with that. Just self-care is what we're Huge, talking about. Yeah. It was it Gandhi that said, normally I meditate once a day. When I'm busy, I meditate twice a day. Is that what he said? Yeah, I, I think it was that. kind of someone. Someone yeah. wise and old. And, do you, do you and guys dead. meditate? Uh, I do. Uh, do you know that these light and sound machines, um, they have like binaural sounds and okay. uh, like light vision goggles that kind of they simulate the experience of meditation. So I do that oh, wow. every okay. now and again, uh, which is, you know, why no, I I'm healthy. Yeah, nice. <laughs> <laughs> I go to the gym though, and it's amazing going to the gym how actually your yeah. mental and physical oh. health have, yeah, they're completely changed. And it, it's, it's weird, it's almost like a therapy session. Yeah. Like you go in and suddenly you come out and your sense of perspective about your problems in inverted commas, whatever they may be, suddenly they, they don't seem as insurmountable. Absolutely. Well, I think there's something meditative even in working out, right? You have to focus, but yeah. it's running and focusing on your breathing or lifting or whatever it is. So you're in the there and now. So all this noise, and I think that's the other thing, you know, there's so much going around. You know, you need to curate your consciousness, right? There's a lot of junk out there, right? Whether it's the trolls online or whether it's the worry that you're not doing enough or whatever it is. So having a place, whether it's meditating or the gym where it's just about that I think is, is a, yeah, hugely beneficial. Actually you made me think about something I play basketball uh, regularly and it's something I've noticed basketball is a very physical very competitive sport you, you know you hit people you get hit it's, it's very like that and one of the things I noticed every time I'm driving to the court I find like and this is maybe a man thing or maybe it's just a constant thing I wanted to ask you what that's about it's like I feel myself uh, like when I'm at home with my wife, I'm very gentle, I'm very calm, etc. But when I'm driving to basketball, I feel like almost like a hard shell that I'm kind of closing up, ready for that fight. What is what is that about? Do you, is there a theory that explains this? 
Well, it's, it look so much of our behavior is situation specific, right? So you know, different you know, the idea that we're different people in different situations. Mm -hmm. Of course, you're gonna you know be different at home than you are there. So clearly, whatever those kind of expectations, those triggers are, have to do with kind of being competitive, with kind of being hyper masculine, and and that works for you in that situation. So what you're doing is you're kind of preparing for that. Um, I remember um, a friend of mine that worked in addiction for a long time saying to me. Um, that uh, the vast majority of overdoses tend to happen in places where people aren't used to shooting up. And she said, because the minute that you shoot up in a different place, you don't have those visual cues, right? Mm -hmm. So you're having mm -hmm. the visual cues of, I'm in the car, mm -hmm. I've got my shorts mm -hmm. on, I've got the music. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you're, you know, you're, it's Pavlovian, right? Yeah. And it's the same thing. When you don't have those visual cues, you, you know, you, you act differently. Mm -hmm. I've got, I've got a little toxic masculinity <laughs> as, I'm, as I'm driving to this. Uh, listen, I was going to ask you about, you talk about skin, but I imagine that the psychosomatic effect goes way beyond skin. I'm sure it affects everything. W what about things like cancer and things like that? Is that something that's affected by your mental state? There's, there's a huge amount of research to suggest that even things like wound healing are affected by your mental state. Um, recovery after, my, my dad had a, a heart operation years ago and I remember that it's amazing work being done at UCL around journaling and, and wound healing recovery and just kind of the ability just to kind of say this is what I did today and this is what was good about the day or bad. Um, some amazing results. So we know absolutely in almost every realm this idea that the mind's you know here and the body's here it's not true, you know, the two are connected, you know, and it's not mumbo jumbo, it's not kind of think yourself better and it'll be great, it's, it's much deeper than that. We're trying to, you know, now we're kind of finding the mechanisms that actually translate into what it means, into how your immune system works or is compromised, into, you know, how le differing levels of hormones affect um, the, the way that your bo body repairs itself or, or inflammation or whatnot. To wrap up, I wanted to move because onto depression, so it end it on a high. But th because this, I talk to a lot of people about you know about mental health, especially because I'm in comedy and everybody seems to have a mental health issue in comedy. Otherwise, why would you be on a stage telling jokes to people? What if Look, you're just funny, naturally funny? Like me? <laughs> yeah, but you, you wouldn't feel the need to get up on stage seeking affirmation from strangers. I hate to break it to you. What is the difference between being a bit down? and having depression, and at what point should you seek help from somebody? I'm so glad you asked that. Um, I think we kind of, in our society, we use words like, oh, I'm anxious or oh, I'm depressed, and and we think, you know, it means depression and anxiety. Actually, the, you know, depression is there's a quantitative difference. So yeah, we all know what it feels like to be low. But when you speak to someone who's, who's going uh, through sort of serious depression, there's a huge sense of, of overwhelming hopelessness and helplessness. Um, the, the basics, you know, I, I, I'm gonna get up in the morning and take a shower, feel like I'm gonna, you know, climb a mountain. Um, you begin to, to isolate socially. It affects your sleep. It affects the way that you eat. It affects your libido. So it's like an all-encompassing thing. So this idea that people are like, oh, well, if you're depressed, just, you know, snap out of it. You know, and thank goodness we're kind of moving away from that. But, you know, I think part of that's happened because we all know what it feels like to be down, right? Mm. And to be down, you know, even when you're really down, you kind of know that this will pass. There's a part of you that knows. When you're seriously depressed, there's a big part of you that thinks that this will never pass. Not only won't it pass, that somehow this is a character flaw in me that won't pass. And I think that's one of the saddest things about depression, that there's no sense of entitlement over it in the way that there would be over any other illness, you know? So, you know, God forbid someone has, you know, cancer or MS, there's like a sense of, you know, I have this and I'm gonna fight it and it's gonna be... With depression, it's like, yeah, but really everyone's depressed. Is it, you know, is it just me? And I, you know, if, I think if people hear nothing else, they need to feel a sense of entitlement over their mental health the way that they do over their physical health because, um, well, that, that's the only way to get the support that you need. And when we know that it's a, it's, it's a very big killer the way that a lot of physical illnesses are. Well, as a slight counterpoint to that, I know for myself, right, that I can very, I, and maybe I'm misusing the word depression, but I can create for myself an experience of depression, whatever that is, very easily. I just need to not go out of the house, not do any exercise, not hang do anything. Hang out with me. Hang out with Francis, <laughs> that always helps. Uh, not do any exercise, right, not, not go out of the house, not spend any time with my wife, not spend time with friends. Uh, play too many computer games, maybe drink too much alcohol, right? If I do five or six things for a period of two weeks, I will be feeling like like you just described, guaranteed. And uh, how much of it 
is within our control. There is the possibility of the self-care that you've talked about to make ourselves better. Sure. Look, I, I think that there's definitely things that you can do to make yourself better and make yourself feel worse, right? We know that depression has a genetic element, mm -hmm. right? So now we say you can win with a losing car, a card and, and lose with a winning card, right? So right. even if you have a winning card, if you like you're saying, you're kind of socially isolating and drinking and not kind of, you know, exercising, you can very easily feel awful. Um, the difference is, is that for people who who experience sort of um, kind of serious depression is that it, it's just it's a it's a lot harder and and they, they need some some support to get there so there's sure. a qualitative difference to it and, and we believe that um, it, it's just it's harder to shift so it's not to say and I want people listening again there's absolutely things you can do but if they're not working for you and they're working for everyone else doesn't mean that you're doing them wrong mm -hmm. it just means you have a more serious form of depression yeah and you need help and you need help yeah. Well, on that note, <laughs> you all need help. That's it. That's that's the whole point of the show. Uh, listen, Linda, it's been absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for Thank coming you. to talk to us. The question we always like to ask our guests at the end is: Is there one issue that we no one talks about that we ought to be talking about, or maybe just something we haven't covered in the interview that you think is important to, to talk about? Um, I guess. I guess. I think for me at the moment, I think we need to be talking about how. Um, the development of um, artificial intelligence is going to affect not just what we're going to do economically but sort of socially uh, as a group because I think it's going to come perhaps a lot quicker than people um, uh, expect. It's already starting to have some effect on us and I think we just need to have sort of more serious conversations about how to protect our kids and ourselves. And what kind of thing are you talking about when, when you say that specifically, when you talk about AI and things like that? Well, I think already it's affecting the job market. So you, you've got um, kids who uh, are looking for jobs that won't exist by the time that you know they're out of you know high school and university who are in their teens now so I think you know that's going to be um, a really big obstacle for governments when you have you know a lot of joblessness we know that joblessness and, and you know poor mental health go go hand in hand we know that it's already an issue I you know and I think with the advent of automation which is happening more and more it's going to get worse and I just think we need to really think about it not just in terms of economics but in terms of a sort of our societies or society's mental health you know our kind mm. of collective subconscious what does this mean because a sense of purpose is very important and I don't think necessarily you have to make X amount of money to have a sense of purpose but you need to kind of figure out what you have to offer and where you belong and and uh, you know I, I think that before that sneaks up on us we just need to have the right conversations Fantastic. Right. And you have a podcast which is called The Psychology Behind. That's right. Uh, and then you cover different topics. And it's all very kind of uh, positive change focused, I think, from what I've seen. It's really about how do you be happy? How do you do this, right? Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so it's basically we take um, sort of recent research. It's a very short podcast, 15, 20 minutes. We take a study out about, you know, how do I deal with shyness? How do I deal with failure? How to become happier? All good for you, mate. <laughs> <laughs> and we, uh, we, yeah, we analyze the research and we kind of use it in actionable tips what are the five things you can do today to help you so i've already subscribed <laughs> <laughs> perfect and uh, you're on twitter at at dr linda underscore p perfect we'll put that in in the in the video as well thank you so much for coming on thank you. Uh, thank you. if you've enjoyed it guys subscribe as always uh, click that bell button next to the subscribe button we are on twitter on instagram on facebook all these terrible social media platforms that please keep using them <laughs> to support our channel <laughs> at triggerpod um, and uh, if you've enjoyed it, we'll see you in a week's time with another brilliant episode. Thanks very much. Thanks, guys.